Test, test, test. We're good? OK. All right. And I'm going to move my mic up a little closer, too. OK. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, everyone, for being here once again. And so first, we're gonna, uh, what I'm going to do here is just, uh, just as a reminder, last, uh, last week in session one, um, we talked about how Latin was the language um, of the, it wasn't, it, you know, Greek was really the first, we could say, the first language of the Christians. That's fair to say. Uh, through most of the parts of uh, Europe and what would be today the Roman Empire. But that in, in uh, does anyone remember where uh, Latin really took steam in its growth? Africa, Africa northern Africa, right. Meanwhile, in uh, Rome, it was still Greek for quite a while, uh, really up until the, the late fourth century. The language of the mass was Greek, but then finally Latin sort of took over, it prevailed. And it was really the language of the mass since then up until the, really, let's say, the, the 20th century. Okay. Um, but here's a question in, his, in the history of, of this, this question is, why did the church continue to use Latin? Because remember, we said as you went on into like the, oh, 7th century and 8th century, you start having these, uh, these other languages developing out of Latin, right? like French and Italian and Spanish and Portuguese. Um, so, you know, eventually Latin faded as a commonly spoken language. And yet, it was preserved in the church. It was preserved in the church. So one of the questions we're going to look at is, why was that? Why was that? Um, I also did not do a lot of study on this, but I just thought to myself, I have to at least mention that there was a controversy uh, of, um, in Europe about using the common language. And this would have been um, people like John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Jan Hus. Okay, he was a, he was Czech, he was Bohemian. And he was a priest, he was ordained a priest in the year 1400. And he was kind of influenced by Wycliffe. But one of the things that, uh, there was a big movement, a big push. This is before the time of Martin Luther. This is like, uh, we're talking, I don't know, 100 years, 150 years before Luther, there was already some ideas that you could almost kind of call proto-Protestant ideas. One of them was, um, and these are not bad ideas, it's just, it's just kind of things that the, uh, Martin Luther and, and those guys would, would also themselves embrace. Things like um, a greater place for the vernacular, so um, this is when you start getting uh, Bible tra Bibles translated into common language. The church always was a little bit nervous about this, and some people think, oh, it's because the church didn't want people to read the Bible. That's, that's bogus. <laughs> the church, uh, long before you had uh, Protestantism, you had, in the early church, a strong devotion among Catholics of reading the Bible. Now, not everybody could read throughout the history of the church. I mean, it's not like we have the literacy we do today, but this practice of the spiritual reading of, of Scripture has been going on for centuries. Um, however, there was always a concern with just letting people translate things into any language they, they want because there was always the, the possibility you were going to have inaccuracies. You were going to have uh, wrong translations. And also the idea of people just individually doing Bible studies, we do that today, and that sounds, you know, it's a good thing. But also there is always the danger when you have people kind of doing their own independent Bible studies apart from the teaching authority of the church that they can fall into error. That was always a concern of the church. That's out there. But um, Jan Hus, I, I didn't have a chance to do a lot of study on this, but certainly he would have been a proponent of using the vernacular in, um, in the Mass and having vernacular translations of the Bible. Uh, again, next week we're going to talk about the Second Vatican Council and what it says about what role does the vernacular play in Mass. There is a role for it, okay? So we're going we're to look at the, these two sort of tensions, like Latin, the place of Latin, the importance of Latin, and also the importance of the vernacular. Okay, how do we reconcile these two things that are valuable? Um, so first, um, 
what I'm looking at today, and I, my handout, my talk is basically on my handout. These are just my notes. So I, I was going to make a cool PowerPoint, and I'm like, nah, I don't have time for that. So I'm just going to give you guys my notes, okay? Um, I just was too lazy today to do that. Um, but anyways, here we go. So I'm really looking at John the 23rd, St. John the 23rd, Pope St. John the 23rd. He wrote an apostolic constitution in February 22nd, 1962, uh, called Veterum Sapientia, all right? And this is really about the advantages of Latin. This is about the advantages of Latin. This is, this is shortly, first of all, shortly before he was going to die. It was also shortly before we start seeing the Second Vatican Council put out certain documents, okay, including Sacrosanctum uh, Concilium, which is the document on the liturgy, which first, which basically was saying there can be a good use, there could be a good value to having parts of the Mass in the vernacular language, the common language of whatever people, whatever, wherever you are, okay. Um, so, um, he says, uh, and this document, it really, it's, it's, it's really mostly about, it's not really mostly about Latin in the Mass, because that was just taken for granted, because that's what people had. I mean, it wasn't really questioned. Well, it was, it was questioned. There was time where people were saying, could we have parts of the prayer in the vernacular? But uh, it, was a, it was the common practice. But he's really talking about the benefit that Latin has overall for the whole church. So, but his points are very uh, applicable to Latin in the liturgy. So, his, so he basically says, look, there's three main reasons why the church prefers Latin. There's three reasons, all right? Um, and the first reason, he says, is Latin is universal. And it's kind of interesting. In the document, he says, it gives rise to no jealousies. So, in other words, you know, we have to remember, we're American, so like, we're like, oh, English, everyone speaks English. But imagine if you have a church that encompasses the entire world, you have all these cultures, all these languages. What's going to be, like, don't we have to have all language that kind of is like the way we communicate, that is sort of our official language, our common language? Now, I like English, so I'm like, let's do it, let's have it in English, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's, right, hey, I'm lazy, let's, I don't want to have to learn another language, let's do it in English. But the reality is, um, Latin kind of, it was kind of a neutral language because it developed and it encompassed a lot of, uh, the, well, the Roman Empire, a lot of the known world, where, which was the cradle for the, the birth of the church. And it, it just, and, and John the 23rd said, in God's providence, um, the Catholic Church kind of grew up in and with the Roman Empire. Of course, the Roman Empire eventually fell, but in the midst of that, Latin was the language that kind of kept a lot of people together for a lot of, a lot of centuries. And so he said it, it, was a, it was a language that kind of preserved unity among the church. And so you don't have like, oh, you know, it's not like other uh, missionaries like, oh, we got to learn French. Well, that did happen, I guess, in Africa and all that. But, you know, but it's, 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 there was not like one language was the powerful language. This was, it was just this almost, let's, I, I consider it almost a neutral language. It was this other kind of language that was united the church. Um, I also make the point that in the Mass, um, the use of Latin, and, and, and forget about the controversies of using it today. Think about the year 1900 or something, okay? If you went to Mass in uh, Huntley, Illinois, and then you went to Mass somewhere in Africa, it was the same Mass. I know you might think like, but Father, I'm not going to go to Africa. All right, all right maybe, good point. <laughs> But there's something that's just amazing about that. I, I think there's something marvelous. And like, this is a world religion. And actually the same worship that goes on in Little Huntley, Illinois, is the same that goes on in Paris, and is the same that goes on in, in, in Africa. There's something kind of remarkable about that. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a feature that is a plus. Um, so uh, being able to pray along with the Mass anywhere in the world uh, also, of course, communicating. Again, there's just the bottom line where John the 23rd's like, hey, if, I, if we have to put out a document out, we've got to put it in a language that everybody is familiar with, right? And at that time, people studied Latin, so Latin was the case. Do you guys remember how doctors used to write in Latin? Do you guys remember that? No. Okay, no? Okay. <laughs> Trust, take my word for it. Doctors used to write in Latin. They did that because as, and scientists did too. Look at the, the names of plants, right, where they come up. Because as science spread, you had people from different countries all had to look at, they had to look at data, they had to look at classifications, and so there was this need, like, science is, is becoming a global endeavor, we need to have a global 
uh, language that can kind of help us understand no matter where we are, what it is. That has gone, that's fallen away, but that's why doctors used to write prescriptions in Latin, because if you were a pharmacist, you, were, you had to know it. Um, okay, so uh, also the Latin connects Catholics across, not only across the world, but across time. So if you think about this, and, and John the 23rd calls Latin, I like this word, he says, it's a general passport to the proper understanding of Christian writers of antiquity and the documents of the church's teaching. I like the idea of a passport. Like, if you know Latin, I mean, they told us this in seminary. I don't have a great Latin background, okay, but they told us, like, boy, if you, if you understood Latin, if you studied Latin, you could read, like, hundreds of years of writings of Christians. Now, some of that, a lot of that is translated now into English, but a fraction only, right? Uh, so I, the idea of a, being a passport, it, like, it like lets us go back in time and read. What did St. Augustine write about this? What did St. Jerome write about this? What did Gregory the Great write about this? Um, but even in the Mass, if you think about this, um, well, he also says, John the 23rd said, Latin is a most effective bond, binding the church of today with that of the past and of the future in a wonderful continuity. So, but if you think about this, when we pray the Agnus Dei, I wrote down, like, if you pray the Agnus Dei, even just that one part of the Mass, if you say it in Latin, um, you're saying, it's kind of, to me, it's cool, because you're saying and singing the same words that St. Augustine used in Northern Africa uh, at the turn of the 5th century, St. Anselm in the 11th century in England, St. Francis of Assisi in the 13th century in Italy, St. Teresa of Avila in the 16th century in Spain, Saints Andrew Kim Taegan and Paul Chong and the other martyrs in 19th century Korea. So to me, I just think it's kind of a cool thing. And I know this is sort of like mystical and it's not really like practical. It's just to me, it's like a, it's a, it, it might sound theoretical, but when we, when we sing those words to think, St. Therese of Lisieux sang the same chant in mass. And I kind of, that kind of unites me with her, you know? Um, okay, so first thing is Latin is universal. Second thing is, is unchanging. Precisely because it's a dead language, dead language I think meaning, I don't know if this is the exact term, the definition of a dead language, but it's not commonly spoken, right? Um, although it's kind of a slander on Latin, like, hey, you're a dead language. Hey, no, I'm not. You can't call me de a dead language. Um, I mean, in a certain way, it still was alive in the church. It was still alive in the church. Um, in fact, John the 23rd said even, he said they should use, the church should continue to use Latin and even in, in create new Latin words where we have to define uh, some phenomenon that's new to us. You know, like something that comes up in the 21st century, 20th century, there's a new technology. Yeah, sometimes there might not be a word for something in Latin. And he says, he says actually uh, new words could be brought in. So, um, but it's unchanging. So, you know, in English, if, if you look at English, words change, right? They change. Like if you said the word gay, hasn't that changed? Right? What did gay used to mean? It used to mean happy. Yeah. Now it means something else. Okay? Uh, that's, that's in a short time period. Go back 500 years of English, you'll see major changes. Okay? Um, languages change when they're living because people use them, cultural influences come in, they change. So uh, John XXIII said it's because Latin is, not, is, is a dead language in a way, it, it's, it, it's more, it, it's, it's, uh, it's precise. You can use it and, it, and the words don't change their meaning. So it's good for using, for describing things in theology, for being the language of theology and church documents. Um, and he also said, um, he also said this about liturg the liturgical texts. They're written, he says, um, the, the Latin style, he says, um, let me see if I can find where it says it here. But he talks about it being um, the style of Latin. Oh, I'll get that to the next point. I'll get to that. Let's stop that right there. We'll wait on that. Um, so, you know, even today, this is important to know, even today when the church comes out with a, let's say um, the church, uh, when the church came out with the missal, uh, the new missal, the new Roman missal used for mass after Vatican II, 1969, 1970, it was written in Latin, right? It was written in Latin. Um, that's called the, uh, the editio typica, or the typical edition. So then they take that Latin book, the Latin text, which is the official text, and then it gets translated into all the other languages, German, French, 
Portuguese, right? Chinese, uh, Tagalog for, the, for Filipino masses with Tagalog. And now what they have to do is there's rules, like so the, the bishops' conferences have to get together and they draft a translation into the, the local language, the vernacular, and then it has to get approved by the Holy See. It's a whole big process. And as you all know, sometimes those translations can be revised, right? Like our mass, right? Uh, the Lord be with you and also with you, right? Now it's and with your spirit, right? The Latin never changed. It's just that our English translation of it changed because after nothing, this is not an attack on the end with you, okay? Is, that's what I said. Actually, all the way through seminary, I was ordained a priest with the old translation of the English Mass, you know? And then in Advent, my first year of priesthood, I had to switch to the end, all, end with your spirit translation, right? Actually, funny thing is, I had a wedding. I was at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. I had a wedding on Saturday morning. I did the Mass with the, with the old translation, the Lord be with you and also with you. Then at, at like 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, I had the Sunday Mass for Advent, and I, I had to use the new one. So it's kind of interesting, you know? Um, but those, those, the church, can, they can update it. They can update or retranslate. They don't do it that often, but they decided they, that that was important. Um, okay, so, so Latin is it's universal. It's unchanging. Um, and the last thing is, this is an interesting point. John the 23rd said Latin, uh, here's another, another bonus to it, it's non-vernacular. So it's kind of funny because in Vatican II, they're going to say, hey, the vernacular language is actually is a good thing to use in the Mass. But first John the 23rd is going to say, well, let's talk about the benefit of a language that's not vernacular. Let's say not common. And he says... Um, it's not an ordinary language. Latin's not an ordinary language. You don't, go to, you don't use Latin when you go to Jewel. Don't try that. I don't know. It's not going to go over well. Um, so it's not an ordinary language. It's, it's elevated, John the 23rd said. It's, it's elevated for use in the Catholic Church. And he says um, it has a... Okay. The Catholic Church, he says, has a dignity that surpasses every merely, merely human society. This is like the, the, the Church of God. And he calls language, he calls Latin truly Catholic because it has been consecrated. That means made holy. It has been consecrated through constant use by the apostolic see, the church of Rome, the mother and teacher of all churches. So because the church in Rome used it for so many centuries, it's kind of been consecrated. It's holy just for that fact. Uh, this was the language that uh, the martyrs heard when they celebrated mass in some cases. Uh, later martyrs, I suppose. Um, and he says it's a treasure of incomparable worth. So you think about this, many religions have a sacred language, you know? And it, here's just a benefit. This is a benefit. Because I think, I actually agree with Vatican II that there is a benefit to having worship in the vernacular language. I agree with that. Um, but again, we're trying to take this balance of like the benefit of Latin and the benefit of the vernacular language. Um, the benefit of Latin is that it's not our everyday language. So when we worship God, it's like, hey, we're doing something that we don't normally do. I personally think it's really good when we go to Mass. I know everyone's got a different, everyone has, people have different like, sensibilities, what you, what you like about the liturgy, people have different views. Some people like a casual liturgy, some people love the smoke and, uh, what do you call it? Smells and bells, smells and bells. I'm a smells and bells guy. Um, but, but some people like, oh, I like it real casual and just simple. Um, but my opinion is, that um, it's good when we go to Mass that we do things that we don't do normally. Like, where else do you go into a building and there's smoke? Usually if there's smoke, you're leaving that building, right? right? Or where else do you go to a building where there's bells being rung? Or where there's a, a, a guy's wearing these, like, this robe that's made of like, really fine material. And there's gold. There's a gold cup. Like, that's, that, you don't see that when you go to Jewel, you know? And there's a reason for that, because when we're at Mass, we're, we're, we're stepping out of the ordinary and going into the extraordinary. Like, it's, it's a heightened experience, right? And that's why our church has, that's why we have this beautiful church at St. Mary. That's why we have these stained glass windows. We could have had just clear windows, right? You could see clear windows everywhere, but, but you can't see a, a really cool stained glass window of St. Therese of Lisieux, you know, like we have at St. Mary, where she's, you know, she's strewing the petals, flower petals in front of the Eucharistic procession. That's cool. It's different. You go into a church, it's, it's a little dark. 
the light's coming through the window, you got this blue, red, yellow lights on you, uh, you, you have candles, you're lighting candles. These are all like little different sensory things that remind us, hey, we're like, in, we're, we're stepped outside of the, reg, of the re regular life into this other sphere where we're worshiping God. And then we're going to go back out into the world, you know? Latin, because it's, a, 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 it's not the common language, it's a special language, it, when we use it, it can make us realize, hey, I'm doing something different, I'm doing something special. Again, that being said, next week we're going to look at what's the benefit of the vernacular? Because the, uh, the church did say that. I mean, we're going to look next week at what Paul VI said and what Second Vatican Council said and John Paul II, Benedict, and Francis a little bit too about uh, the benefit of, the, of the using the vernacular and how can we balance these two? Maybe is there a role for both of them? Um, and... Oh, I'll just end by saying, um, oh, he says that about the structure. He says Latin has a characteristic nobility in its structure. It's concise, varied, harmonious style, full of majesty and dignity. Uh, makes for singular clarity and impresses, impressiveness of expression. If you ever look at a Latin text like that's prayed, there's a real beauty because of the, the structure and the form of Latin, like we've been talking about how you have so few words because you don't have all these clunky, like, add on like you know other parts of grammar uh so when the priest is praying it and if he knows latin i mean there's a certain beauty and nobility to it again there's gonna be the question of the people saying but i want to know what it means or I, I you know i'm not familiar with latin so we'll look at the benefit of the vernacular too but but this is john the 23rd kind of saying these are some of the reasons why now i will say this too if you read his his epistle his letter he's like saying like um his dream was that latin he wanted to restore Latin to its position of honor and promote its study and use. And to, this, to that extent, that has totally failed. <laughs> uh, you know, for John XXIII, sorry, Pope, he's in heaven, he doesn't care, you know. But, uh, but uh, that was his kind of goal. And he kind of said like, hey, you've got to keep teaching Latin in seminaries. In fact, he said theology should be taught in Latin. Uh, by the time I got to seminary, they did have like a, like a one-year requirement for Latin. Most uh, men no longer, we don't have high school seminaries as much anymore. A lot of men come into seminary later in life, so they haven't had a chance to study Latin, like in Catholic school, and like for 12 years of Latin. That, that's, that's rare today. And maybe, in some ways, when the church changed away from Latin, they probably, there was no way to avoid it. They were going to move away from the importance of Latin. Um, but John the Twenty Third, so his, his goal, his dream, kind of was unanswered, but... Um, uh, Paul VI has an interesting letter or address where he talks about um, the role of Latin now that with the vernaculars coming in. So I don't think I'll turn it over. Okay. Um, thank you, Father. That was excellent. Uh, and yeah, I encourage all of you uh, read Veterum Sapientia. Uh, it's not a very long letter. Uh, and yeah, he. He says some awesome things in there. I think one of my favorite uh, lines that he has is that he calls Latin the like golden vesture that cloaks the wisdom of the ancients and the church fathers. Wow. It's this awesome image of, of kind of the power that, that Latin has. Okay, um, let's see if I can uh, click through my slides here. Uh oh, it was working last week when I used it on Wednesday. But it is not working today. Father, maybe you could click over. Um, yeah, those were placeholders for your talk. Okay, fantastic. We are going to just review the Odd News Day before we jump into our next prayer. So let us uh, look at the screen here, or if you have your handout from last week, you can look at that. Let's just practice a couple times just saying the Odd News Day. We'll go slow the first time. We'll all say it together. Here we go. Anus Dei, qui tolis pecata mundi, miserere nobis. Anus Dei, qui tolis pecata mundi, miserere nobis. Anus Dei, qui tolis pecata mundi, dona nobis pacem. Okay, let's go again. Now let's try and say it at real speed. Okay, here we go. 
Anus Dei, qui tolis pecata mundi, miserere nobis. Anus Dei, qui tolis pecata mundi, miserere nobis. Anus Dei, qui tolis pecata mundi, dona nobis pacem. Fantastic. I think we've all been practicing. Good. So what I'd like to do next is introduce you to the Sanctus. Um, Father, if I could have you uh, click over a slide. Just a little bit about the Sanctus, a little bit of history about this, um, this prayer. It's drawn from Isaiah's vision of God's glory, which can be found in Isaiah 6.3. Now, the words there are a little different, then the chant we have, we've added some things in um, through the history of the liturgy. But the, the basic uh, uh, sentiment is the same. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. One of the amazing things about the Sanctus is that we have pretty solid evidence that this was prayed by Christians already in the first century of the church. This is one of the oldest prayers we have, um, and it was, be, it was something that obviously was, was recited um, in the synagogue by the Jews because they were reading the book of Isaiah. And the Christians are already saying this in the first generations of the church. It's pretty incredible. So let's take a look at the Sanctus in Latin. Okay, so um, on your handout, I've got the text for you. Let me just read the text for you. I'll read it one time through. We'll take a look at the pronunciation of the Sanctus. Uh, I don't think we're doing a Gospel hour. Let's hang out for that. Um, do we? We only got one. That is, yes, that's the Sanctus one. Um, do we have, are there more tables at the corner? Uh, sorry, more handouts in that table back there. There are handouts, but I'm not finding them. Let's take a look. Because I want to make sure everyone's got a Sanctus handout to follow along here. It's, a, it's actually a three-page handout. Um, yes, okay. Let me get a few and bring them over. Okay, does anyone else need a Sanctus handout? Yeah, this is a three-pager because I couldn't fit everything onto a front and back. I've got one, okay. There you are. I'll just leave the extras here. Oh, we need one back there, okay. There you go. Okay. Everyone's good. I think so. Okay, I'm not seeing any, anyone saying they're not good, so let's, let's take a look at the Sanctus. I'll, I'll read through the Sanctus one time, and then we can look at the pronunciation. Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabaot, pleni sunt celi et terra gloria tua, osana in excelsis, benedictus qui venit in nomini domini, osana in excelsis. Hey. Let's take a look at the phonetic pronunciation here. We'll go word by word. I'll say the word first, and you can repeat after me. Sanctus. 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 Dominus. Deus. Sabaot. Pleni, Pleni. Sunt. sunt, Celi, Celi. Et. Et, Terra, Terra. Gloria. Gloria, Tua, Tua. Osana. Osana, In, In. Excelsis. Excelsis. Let's do that one again, because this is that, if you remember from a pronunciation guide, this is one of those vowel combinations that has a different sound, the X and the C 
right next to each other makes that ksh sound. Okay, so let me say one more time, you'll repeat after me. Excelsis. Good. Benedictus. Qui. Venit. In. Nomine. Domini. Osana. In. Excelsis. Very good. Now, the other thing to note in here is that it's not Hosanna, right? Because the H is always silent, right? Unless it's in between two eyes. Um, and we might come across that in the course of our studies in the next couple of weeks. We'll see. So it's Osana. Very good. Okay, let's try that one more time. We'll say it all together. We'll go slow. Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabaoth, Pleni Sunt Celi et Terra Gloria Tua. Osana in excelsis, Benedictus qui venit in nomine Domini, Osana in excelsis. Very good. Okay. Well, I think we're ready to maybe say it just a little faster. Okay, let's try it. Let's give it a go. Okay, let's do one more time. Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabaoth, Pleni sunt celi et terra gloria tua. Osana in excelsis, benedictus qui venit in nomine domini. Osana in excelsis. Very good. Okay. So now that we've practiced saying it, let's take a look at the translation. Okay. Sanctus is a really interesting word because in English we actually have two options for, trans for translation. Okay, think about um, Mary, Holy Mother Mary. In Latin, Sancta Maria. Or you could think of any of the other number of saints. Right? They are the Sancti. But in English, for sanctus, you can also say holy. Okay, so sanctus can mean saint or it can mean holy in English. Okay. Now, maybe you'll notice that saint is just an Englishized version of the Latin word sanctus. It's not actually a different word. It's just kind of spelled and pronounced a little differently. Whereas holy, right, that comes from the German side of English. A quick, quick pop quiz on something that I didn't teach you, but maybe you know about this. Okay, English is um, a roughly, roughly 50-50 mix, mix of, of Latin and German. Does anyone know why that's the case? It's, it's connected. It's connected. Yes. That's exactly right. So in the year 1066, William the Conqueror from Normandy, France, invades and conquers England. Now the Normans spoke an old version of French, which was much closer to Latin than modern French is to what they spoke. Okay, so they're coming into England. They're speaking this kind of variant on Latin, has all the Latin roots, a lot of Latin vocabulary, and you have the Anglo-Saxons living in England speaking Anglo-Saxon, which is a German language. Okay, so English is this mix of this old French and Anglo-Saxon. So you will often get two options for the same thing in English, like sanctus, 
right? You can say saint, which is just the Latin word, or holy, which is just the German version of it. Okay. So here, right, because we're just, um, we're not going to say uh, saint God, right? No, it doesn't follow, okay? Holy Lord God. Okay, so holy, 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 dominus, dominus, Lord or master, right? The dominus in, in the ancient Roman world, he was the, the master of the household, the dominus. So Lord, and we know Deus from last week, God. Now, um, really interesting, um, the word sabaot, not a Latin word. Uh, Shirley, do you think you could click to the next slide? Because I have a little bit of information about sabaot. Okay, just a little word study here. It's actually a Hebrew word, right? And it, it means something like an unnumbered multitude would be uh, the closest English translation you could give it. Okay. Um, now, St. Jerome, when he was writing the Vulgate, we learned about that last week, he uh, translates it into Latin as exercitium, which is um, a plural form of the word army. So he says that this is the Lord God of this massive army, right? Because the hosts being described by Sabot are the army of angels, the, an the angelic heavenly hosts that you hear about. Okay, so when we say um, Sabaot, right, we're actually saying a Hebrew word. It's really interesting, right? But when you see Sabaot, you can think of just this un unnumbered multitude of the army of angels, right? That's what Sabaot is. And so in the liturgy, we just keep Sabaot. But if you go read um, Isaiah 6.3 in the Vulgate, you will see uh, Dominus Exercitum. So it'll be a little different in that Latin. Okay, so holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, plaini sunt celi, full are the heavens. Right? Um, uh, we saw celi last week. Okay? Plaini, just full, right? Um, if there's a um, kind of a, if there's, if you have uh, plenty of something, right? You've got a lot of it. Okay. So, full are the heavens and the terra, the earth. Gloria tua, um, with your glory. This is again where case comes, comes in, right? You see that terra ends in A. You see that gloria and tua also end in A. But they're actually performing very different roles in the sentence, okay? So you have terra, right, which is the subject of your sentence, right? The, the, the earth is full. But gloria tua doing something totally different, that this is, uh, what, what is the earth full with? It's full with glory. Okay, so another, another reason why it's good to understand that there's these cases in Latin. It can be confusing. You might think that, all well, these are all the same. Maybe it's an adjective modifying a noun, but there's a different story going on. Okay, full are the heavens and the earth with glory yours. This is a very literal translation. Right? We reorder things in English because we like to put our adjectives before our nouns, for example. Hosanna in excelsis. Right? Hosanna in the highest. Okay? The, the excelsis, this is just... The, the highest places, right, if you're going to think about um, heaven as a place, right, it's just like the highest, the highest thing you can think of, right, that's the excelsis, okay. Benedictus, blessed, it's a cool word, it actually means um, well-spoken, well-spoken is a, the literal translation of benedictus, but in English we say blessed, okay, blessed is he who, another relative word, right? Blessed is he who comes, venit. Okay, maybe some of you here have seen a word that looks like venit. Caesar uh, uttered a famous line. I don't know if any of you, 
Okay. Veni, vidi, vici, which means? Okay, see, so you all know some Latin. Awesome, okay. So he said, veni, vidi, vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. So veni, venit, right? It's just the difference between saying, between saying I uh, came and um, uh, he came or comes, okay? Uh, fun fact, so we're all learning the ecclesiastical pronunciation. Right? Veni, vidi, vici, it sounds pretty strong. Right? I came, I saw, I conquered. Do you want to know what it sounds like in classical Latin? If Caesar actually said that? He would have said, Veni, vidi, vici. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. It doesn't sound very manly. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. So, uh, yes, we're gonna, they're, they're often going to, to have him pronounce that um, in a film or something like that. Um, Veni, vidi, vici. Sounds a lot stronger. Okay. So blessed is he who comes in nomine domini. So in the name, nomine, of the Lord, domini. And again, we get oh, Hosanna in excelsis. Um, next slide, because I want to talk to you again about this word, Hosanna. Uh, next one, there we go. Okay, so Hosanna, another word that's not actually Latin, but we say it in the liturgy. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that it's just a Greek form of a Hebrew word, right? So the Greek um, Hosanna from the Hebrew Hoshana. And it just means, uh, it's, it's, it, it, there's some debates about how it ought to be actually translated, but it's, just, it's understood to be a cry for salvation or deliverance. And you see it in the Psalms, for example. Um, so, and this is another word that we know was used by the earliest Christians, right? That they're borrowing this Hebrew word from the Old Testament into their Christian worship. And so it's, again, just, it, you know, it seems like a strange word when you take a close look at it, right? And it's not Latin, it's Hebrew. So, two Hebrew words in the Sanctus prayer. Okay. Fantastic. Let's um, take a look at the chants of the Sanctus. Right, because um, when you're using this kind of in action, right, you're going to be chanting it. So um, hopefully, hopefully we got um, the third page of this handout that has the Sanctus chant. And yes, um, sorry, sure, I don't actually have that one on the slide. So um, I should have the the handout just behind the slideshow there. If you press escape and get out, um, you should be able to find my, um, my handout. Um, go to, just go to uh, pages, uh, the orange thing with the pen down at the bottom. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe I'll come back there and find it for you because I want everyone to be able to follow <laughs> along with this. No worries. So your clicker's not working? No, it wasn't. Uh... Okay, so hopefully we can zoom on on that. Okay, fantastic. So um, like last week, we'll give the chant a go. And we'll see how we do. It's something that you've had some practice singing um, if you've been attending the, uh, the right masses, okay? Um, so, uh, let's, let's try. I, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go kicking this off. Well, let's, let's all follow along. Okay. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabao. Pleni sunt celi et terra. Gloria Tua, Hosanna in excelsis, Benedictus qui venit in nomine Domini, Hosanna in excelsis, 
excelsis. That sounded pretty good. Yeah, I think we're getting our act together. I think we could all just we can all just start the uh, Ascola together, and we'll we'll be good. Okay. Now keep practicing this because um, uh, in in mass, right? When, when we're going to be saying, when we're chanting the Sanctus, uh, especially the nine o'clock mass uh, on the, uh, the the Saturday, sorry, the Sundays that we that we do chant, uh, you're going to be able to lead the rest of the congregation, right? You're going to be standing next to somebody who might not really know what's going on. You're going to be thinking like, Latin? I have no idea how to say this. Or they might even be thinking to themselves, this is silly. Why am I saying Latin? Right? But you're going to be standing next to them and you're going to be able to belt it out loud and say, this is the liturgy. Right? This is something beautiful that we are doing in the liturgy. So um, keep practicing the Sanctus and we will continue to practice it in coming weeks. Now, we do have time. Awesome, we have time. Okay, we've got 10 minutes so we can cover your first uh, prayer of the big three prayers. Okay, so you have another handout for what in English we call the glory be. Okay, so you can, um, we're, we're going to go over this, right? But now you can go home tonight and uh, you can pray the glory be in Latin. Okay? Because we have... Uh, I have it for you here, all laid out as far as its pronunciation goes. So, surely, um, if we can, yeah, get back to the uh, slideshow. Awesome. And let's kick it back one more slide. Yeah, if we can go, yeah, there we go. Fantastic. Okay. So, this is the, um, the glory be. Prayer, right? We're going to be um, talking about the Gloria chant, right? Which is, is chanted during liturgy. We'll talk about that next week. It's much longer, right? Okay, so this is uh, the, uh, the shorter Gloria. I'll say the Latin prayer first, then we'll take a look at the phonetic pronunciation. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritu, Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in seculus seculorum. Amen. Okay, well, let's give this a go together. We'll go word by word. I'll say it first, and you'll say it after me. Gloria. Gloria. Patri. Patri. Et. et. Filio. Filio. Et. et. Spiritui. Now, one more time, because there's that, you're not maybe anticipating that I on the end to be its own syllable. It is. Okay, I'll say it, and you'll say it after me. Spiritui. Spiritui. Very good. Sancto. Sancto. Sicut. Sicut. Erat. Erat. In. In. Principio. Principio. Et. Et. Nunc. Nunc. Et. Semper, Semper. Et, et in, in. Secula, secula seculorum. Seculorum. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's do it one more time. We'll do it all together, but we'll stay nice and slow. Here we go. Gloria Patri et Filio et spiritui sancto, sic ut erat in principio, et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. Okay, let's do it one more time. We'll go a little faster. Here we go. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sic ut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. Okay. Let's take a look at the translation, right? How does this go? Right from the Latin into the English. Um, Shirley, if I could have you uh, just go to the last slide, 
And then uh, that will be our last slide for the night. Okay. So there we go. We're good. Gloria, right? I think we've, we've seen this word. Just glory, right? It's a, a good example of how a lot of English words are really just Latin words, right? Okay, just a little different spelling on the end. So gloria, glory. Patri, patri. So the, uh, the subject case for this is pater, right? Sounds uh, something maybe you've heard um, in the Romance languages before, uh, but it's where you get um, Papa, right? The Pope, right? That he is the father, right, of fathers. So it's glory to the father, so it's just a different case, right? Glory to the father. Et, it's one of these little conjunctions. You'll see it all the time in Latin. It just means and, Okay? Glory to the Father and Filio, to the Son. And to the Spiritui, the Spirit. What kind of Spirit is it? It's again the Sanctus. So Sancto, because we're following the case agreement. Spiritui Sancto, to the, well, Spirit Holy, but to the Holy Spirits. So glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now you'll notice, where's the B? I thought this was the glory B prayer. Where's the B? Right? Well, Latin can do this cool thing where it can just imply that there's a verb present. Right? Doesn't, sometimes they just won't write out, say the verb. They'll just say, like, look, I mean, you all understand what's being said here. We don't need to say the verb. Especially if it's a simple word like be. Okay? So in the Latin, there actually is no verb here for be. But in English, one has been provided in the translation. Okay, so glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Sicut, just as or just like. Erat, just like it was. So erat is a past tense. Just like it was, when? Well, in principio, in the beginning. You'll see principio, there's a lot of words in English you get related to principio. Principle, um, both the kind of, if you have principles and also the principle of a school. Okay, they're all related. Um, uh, uh, prince, right? Uh, the, the kind of rank of royalty, prince. These are um, a couple of examples of what is related to this word in Latin. So, in the beginning, and now, nunc, nunc, now. So, just as it was in the beginning, and now, again, another implied verb, like, and is now, but there's no verb is present, right? Just like it was in the beginning, and understood is now, and another verb to supply, will be, right, because now we're going into the future, right, and uh, will be always, semper, always, always. Um, another fun Latin tie-in. Does anyone know what it is that John Wilkes Booth shouted on stage after he shot President Abraham Lincoln at Ford Theater? What? Seek semper tyrannis, okay? Thus always to tyrants. So John Wilkes Booth speaks Latin after he assassinates President Lincoln. Seek semper tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. Okay, so Latin is, is in places you might not expect in history. Okay, so semper means always. Okay, um, the motto of the, the United States Marine Corps. Semper fideles, always faithful. It's abbreviated Semper Fi. Okay, so uh, Latin um, in places that you might not have expected to see it. Semper means always. Et, and, in secula, seculorum. Literally translated, right? Uh, a seculum, singular, is like a generation. 
uh, or, or an age, just like a period of time, a short period of time. But um, we're uh, uh, giving glory to God into the generations of generations, like just forever forward into the future, into the age of ages, secula seculorum. Now, um, in English, right, we don't say um, and always into the age of ages, right? We say, um, just as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, right? It's a, one of the typical translations in English. But when you say will be forever, right, you're actually kind of missing something. You're missing this idea of, it's like, not just like forever, but it's like the generations of generation, generations forever that you get in the Latin, the secula, seculorum. Okay, um, before we wrap up, Let's try to say the, uh, the Gloria Patri one more time, and then I'll let you go. Okay. Let's say it all together one more time. Ready? Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a good night.